Hi, in this quick bits video, we'll be looking at what the ITC bus is and how it works. And the crosstalk on the bus lane looks pretty bad mm, this morning, yum. so you may have to take an alternate route. Next up on Make FM is... ITC stands for Inter-Integrated Circuit, and can also be called IIC or I2C. The initial ITC specification was created in 1982, and was designed to allow various Philips TTL 5V ICs to communicate with each other at 100kHz. Revisions were added in later years that added faster bus modes, such as 400kHz, 3.4MHz and 5MHz. There are other variants to ITC. TWI, which was a standard created by Atmel and other companies to avoid trademark conflicts. This standard is identical to ITC, but lacks a high-speed mode. There's also SMBus, which is a derivative of ITC, developed by Intel, which includes several differences. There's also PMBus, which is a derivative of SMBus, that adds power management capabilities. ITC is a two-wire, bi-directional, multi-master open drain bus, which means master and slave devices can both transmit and receive. It can operate at 5 volts, 3.3 or down to 1.8 volts. This can make logic level shifting a bit more complicated, but these days most people use the common and cheap BSS138 MOSFET to handle this. Since I2C has open drain outputs that pull the lines down, you will need to add pull up resistors on all devices. Values from 1K to 10 kilo ohms are often used. Devices connected to this bus can sit anywhere on a 7 or 10 bit address space and operate in the same manner as MAC addresses on an Ethernet network. This means you can have up to a theoretical maximum of 1024 devices. However, in practice you are limited by two factors, address space clashes and bus capacitance. There's no real standard for address assignment, so you often have the scenario where device addresses will clash. This can be resolved by bus multiplexes, but will add more complexity to your circuit. The lower the operating voltage, the greater the effect of capacitance caused by wires and tracks, resulting in signals rising and falling more slowly, and also crosstalk across wires. So you either have to lower the clock rate, or shorten your wires when using lower voltages. This limits the practical length of an I2C bus. However, once again, in practice this is much shorter. The I2C protocol uses a fairly simple put-get model transferring data one byte at a time with the master always setting the clock rate. So there's a fair amount of protocol overhead. A typical 7-bit address write interaction will be the master pulling SDA low to indicate the start sequence, followed by an address frame with the first 7 bits being the address, then a low on the 8th bit indicating a write. The slave should then respond with an ACK by pulling the SDA line low on the next clock. Then the master will send an 8-bit ITC register number, with the slave responding with an ACK, followed by the data payload and a slave ACK afterwards. Once complete, the master will indicate a stop condition where SDA is pulled low just after a low to high transition of SCL. SCL and SDA are then kept high to free the bus. When reading from a slave, the sequence initially starts out the same as a write. But this is where it deviates. At this point, the master will send another start sequence, followed by an address frame, with the first seven bits being the address, but the eighth bit indicating a read. Then another slave ACK, followed by the slave sending eight bits of data back to the master, with the master sending an ACK back to the slave on the next clock. Once complete, the master will indicate another stop condition, freeing the bus. When working with high-speed mode devices, the protocol changes slightly. The address frame extends out to include a master code which is transmitted at normal I2C clock rates, but then starts clocking data at a faster rate for the rest of the interaction. Any device capable of high speed mode will recognise this special master code and drop into high speed mode for the duration of the interaction. Once complete, all devices drop back down to normal clock rates. With the 5 MHz ultra fast mode, things change even further. The SCL and SDA lines are used in a similar way to USB and Ethernet lines. It's a unidirectional protocol, so slaves don't send an ACK response, and there's no multi-master capability. There's also only 112 address lines available. So UFM is used for write-only devices, such as LED strips and displays. Bus arbitration is fairly basic, but works well. Every master device on the bus will monitor the SDA line, even whilst sending. 
the first to pull the STA line low, indicating a start sequence, will win the arbitration. In the unusual but possible event of two masters transmitting data at exactly the same time, as in this scenario, the master that detects a difference on the bus will back off and become a slave until a stop sequence is seen from the other master. Another way of looking at it is the master that wanted STA high but was pulled low by another master will lose. So bus arbitration extends for the duration of the interaction, not just the beginning. Note that slaves can transmit on the bus, but will always be clocked by a master, and don't possess the same bus arbitration that exists on the master. Masters can actually claim the bus by not sending a stop sequence, but instead continuing on talking to as many slaves as it wants to. When a slave is sending data to the master, it is the master that controls the clock, but sometimes the slave isn't ready to send data back to the master. If this happens, the slave can pull down the SCL line, at which point the master will detect this change and will not take any action until the slave releases SCL. This is called clock stretching and is a primitive form of flow control. RTC is a fairly straightforward interface, but there are a few things to watch out for. Make sure all your RTC devices on the bus operate at the same speed. Otherwise, you'll see bus arbitration issues. Ensure you have pull-up resistors on SDA and SCL for every RTC device on the bus. Otherwise, you could potentially see the bus hang and be non-responsive. Some 3.3 volt devices are 5 volt tolerant, but not all, so always check your voltages. At higher speeds, keep your cable length short. Heck, at any speed, keep your cable length short. Some devices don't fully adhere to the ITC spec and don't have an open drain ACL. These types of masters won't work on a multi-master bus, nor support clock stretching. Some ITC software implementations, aka bit bashing, don't fully adhere to the spec, and you'll see lots of bizarre issues there. So that's about it for a quick overview of ITC. If you want further information, then check out my website. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. And that's it for another episode. Don't forget to check out my website for further details, and thanks for watching.